we'll begin on the um since we're talking about mass we start with a prayer um to our blessed lady which is normally used um before mass it's in the missal in the name of the father the son and of the holy spirit amen O oh, most blessed virgin mary mother of mercy and of love I, a poor and unworthy sinner, fly to thee with all my heart and all my affection. I implore thy loving kindness, that even as thou didst stand beside thy dear son as he hung upon the cross, so will thou also stand by me, a poor sinner, and by all the priests who are offering mass today and throughout the entire church, and besides all thy faithful people receiving the most sacred body of thy son. Grant us that by thy grace, we may offer a worthy and acceptable sacrifice in the sight of the most high and undivided Trinity and receive it worthily and fruitfully, amen. Um, just um, as we begin, the mass, as we all know, is called the sacrifice. It is the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary. And in recent times, we find increasingly um, lay people, especially the animators at, at um, the Novus Ordo Mass, but sadly, even priests and bishops referring, it, referring to the Mass as a celebration. It is a celebration, but certainly not in the sense that um, is frequently depicted with dancing and singing and clapping and all kinds of gymnastics. It is and always will be the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary. And as such, we need to place ourselves on Calvary with the same disposition that um, Our Lady had and um, St. John, St. Uh, Mary Magdalene, Salome, and all the other women. What I have, I'm going to do, what I hope to do, is to First of all, begin with a description, an explanation of how the mass is the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary from a scriptural point of, of view. And then secondly, perhaps next week, please God, we'll have an over, overview of the traditional Latin mass as taught by St. Thomas Aquinas. And following that, perhaps in about three weeks, we will have the theology of the Roman canon alone, so just the, the canon. Um, and after that, hopefully, uh, the, we'd have reached a, uh, a point of great interest, and then we go into the ceremonies of the mass following that. So today, um, I'm going to go over the handout, the notes that I attached, I hope you received them. And we'll be going through those. Uh, um, and then next week, we'll have the, an overview of the whole Mass uh, in, according to St. Thomas Aquinas. So I'm going to begin by sharing my screen with you and um, explain um, the various movements of the priests on the sanctuary. I am, of course, presuming that everybody here is familiar with the um, traditional mass. Um, if, if not, it's not um, a big deal because we, we will um, we'll get to, to it um, sooner or later. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Right, so share screen. And um, as I said last week, I'm still learning this. Um, okay, can you see the screen, my notes? Yes. 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 Uh, oh, great. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Right. So we're in business. Okay. Um, just as an overview, for those who are new to the traditional mass, um, the, this is how the Mass was celebrated in the West. Um, 
right up until Vatican II, until Pope Paul VI decided to replace it or attempt to replace it in 1969, 1970. Um, the confusion between the old mass and new mass is not about language, it's about right and more important, it's about theology. Now the traditional mass, which is also called the um, ancient use, also called the Tridentine mass, also called the Roman mass and so on, um, is, is essentially the rites for, for, of adoration that we offer to God and it comes from the apostles, there's no doubt about it. I think when we've been through today's um, class catechesis, you will see how tied in it is to the gospel. So just as an overview of the passion of our Lord, very quickly. Our Lord celebrated the Last Supper. That was the Passover of the Jews. We're told in the scriptures, after supper was ended, he took bread. And it's at this point that the Christian sacrifice begins. The, the Christian sacrifice begins at, at this point. And the, oh gosh, I, I, I did sprinkle holy water, but it didn't seem, it didn't seem to help. Because believe me, the dogs do not do this. Oh, you know. Um, okay. Right. So he, our Lord then went to the Kijon Valley. He went down into the garden and he took three of the disciples into the innermost part. And there he asked them to pray. Peter, James, and John were with him. They stepped. There's a sweat of blood. And then soon after that, the Judas arrives with the cohort. Um, our Lord is arrested, and then he's taken to the judges. There are four of them. The Annas first. Annas is not the high priest, but Caiaphas is. So he's taken to Annas, then to Caiaphas. He is uh, hailed before the Sanhedrin, the full, full court of Jews. And following that, in the morning, He's taken to Pilate. Pilate attempts to, to get out of the judge in the matter. He's sent to Herod. Herod sends him back. Um, again, Her um, Pilate presents um, our Lord to the, to the Jews, um, offering them, you know, our Lord's, offering them either choice between our Lord and Barabbas. They choose um, Barabbas, and our Lord goes, is taken to to Calvary, there he dies, is buried. So it is this that the mass, this part of the mass from the garden to his burial, resurrection, that we focus on. And so we begin the, the, um, the story of the mass. So the priest enters the sanctuary. This corresponds to the, our Lord going down to the garden of Gethsemane. He goes into the innermost part of the garden. And we read, <clears throat> we read this in the four gospels, Matthew, as in the, in the column in italics, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, I'm sure that you're aware that the not everything that happens is contained in the in all the gospels, but some things are recorded in one gospel or two and not in the others. So our Lord then is in the in the garden. <clears throat> the priest has entered the sanctuary. He's at the foot of the stairs, at the bottom, at the foot of the altar. He begins the prayer, the intro it. I'm um, sorry, he begins to pray, um, the Yudhikame, the psalm. And <clears throat> this represents the prayer that our Lord began in the garden. And we read of this in two of the, the, the gospels, namely Matthew and Mark. After the reading, after saying the Yudhikame, the priest goes on to say the 
the confiture, I confess. And this is symbolic, it corresponds to the sweat of our Lord, the agony of our Lord in the garden. And St. Luke records that great drops of blood fell from his, from his head, this, the, the bloody sweat, which in fact is a medical phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> it occurs when someone is in such deep distress that the, 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 the veins compress and so it forces blood through the pores. Um, I think uh, there's a doctor, Barbara, I believe his name is, who, who wrote um, a, a short book, a very short book, a, um, a, doctor's, a doctor's presence on, on Calvary, and he describes that phenomenon. So then, having said the, the I confess, the priest ascends the altar, and he goes to the epistle side. He doesn't kiss it. He, he goes to the epistle side. That is the right side of the altar. And there he reads the um, intro it. So what happened to our Lord when he was arrested? Well, he was taken. He was bound. And as a prisoner, he was led to Annas first and foremost. There in the court of Annas, he's falsely accused um, and blasphemed. There were several false witnesses who came forward to say what they knew was not true. And um, there he is struck, he is struck on, on the face by the, um, the servant. And notice in these two, two incidents where he's bound to take it to Annas, only St. John um, records it. Um, so he now, having read the intro it, the priest goes to the center, to the middle of the altar, and there the Kyrie is recited. And this corresponds to our Lord having been taken from the court of Annas, from the house of Annas, to the a house of Caiaphas. And what happened to the house of Caiaphas? We're told, well, first of all, we're told by St. John that Peter followed our Lord to the house of Caiaphas and that he followed at a distance. Our Lord had already prophesied, he warned um, Peter at the Last Supper that Peter would deny him three times. Peter said, Lord, even if all of these deny you, I will not. I said, the cock will not throw until you yourself have denied knowing me three times. And so it's at this point that um, at the house of Caiaphas that the denial occurs because Peter has come to the, to the gate. To the, he's let in, well, John is with him. He's let into the, the, the court by the girl who asks him point blank, you know, aren't you one of them? Didn't I see you in the garden? And he says, no, I don't, it wasn't me. And Peter goes and warms himself by the fire, animal comforts. And there he again is, is noticed. And then the, the third time they said, why your accent gives you away, you're Galilean. And then he calls down, um, swears, calls down oh, saying that, no, he doesn't know the man. And at that point, the cock grows. And at that point, our Lord turns and looks at him. And St. Luke is the one who records this. So the, the priest now turns, having said the Kyrie Eleso, he turns to the people and he says, Dominus Obiscum, the Lord be with you. And this is symbolic of him looking at Peter and Peter catches the eye of the Lord and he weeps bitterly. He goes out and he weeps bitterly um, for having done the very thing he said he, he wouldn't do. Now, what is interesting is that when, our, when the priest is in the center of the altar, he is always speaking, uh, it, it always represents the supreme authority. So here in the first, the first time he's in the middle of the altar, he is, he, our, our Lord is before Caiaphas, who is the supreme spiritual authority. And it is there before the supreme authority that our Lord converts Peter 
who himself is going to become the supreme authority on earth in the church. So having said Dominus Fubiscum, Peter, having been um, felt remorse and um, repents, the priest goes now to the right-hand side. Um, so number eight, we're looking at number eight. The priest goes to the um, right-hand side um, to read the collect and the epistle. So this represents him being brought to Pilate. And again, we read of this in the four gospels. Um, the, the, the right hand side of the altar, the epistle side, represents the, the south. It's essentially those who are well disposed, but maybe in ignorance or, or whatever. So, but the south is really the good side. The north is the unbelievers who are in, in total opposition to the gospel. So having, having read the collect and the epistle, the priest now goes to the middle of the altar. And there, what does he do? He, he says the, the, the blessing for himself so that he might read, read the gospel. And this is where it symbolized where he's taken, where the Lord is taken to Herod, and there he is mocked. And we, in fact, only read, we read this only in St. Luke's Gospel, where um, St. Luke gives us some details. It tells, he tells us that our Lord is dressed in white, the garments of a fool, that he is insulted, he's mocked, um, and he is sent back. Um, we, um, we're also told that our Lord didn't say, speak a word to, to Herod. So our Lord is taken back. Um, so the, the gospel has been read. And so the priest now returns to the middle of the altar. The middle represents those who have supreme authority. So that's essentially Pilate. And again, we read this in St. Luke's gospel. So he's now once more in the presence of Pilate. Pilate makes several attempts to, um, to free our Lord because Pilate recognizes that the that our Lord is there due to the envy, to jealousy, um, that there's no offense as far as the Roman state is concerned. So, what does a priest do at this point? Don't forget that the gospel has been read. He goes to the middle of the altar. He says, Dominus Rubiscum, as the secret is read. Um, sorry, the, um, the, sorry, the antiphon is read. The, and he uncovers the chalice. Now the chalice represents the body of our Lord. It represents our Lord. The pattern which covers the chalice represents the stone that's rolled against the mouth of the tomb. Okay. Um, because when the, the um, well, after I'll come to, come to that a little later on. So since the chalice is uncovered and the chalice rep represents the body of our Lord, it's equivalent to our Lord being stripped of his garments, which again, we read in St. Matthew's gospel. So uncovering the chalice, um, our Lord is stripped of his garments. Now remember, all, this this is the the, the 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 rite, the symbolism that is contained in the mass. And so when we are attending mass, it, this is very useful for us to place ourselves um, in in the midst of the action, so that we understand symbolically what takes place. Um, there are many saints who have written commentaries on the Mass, as they have done on various parts of the, of the scriptures. And so, again, it's always a matter of um, which, uh, which spirituality. The, this, this is the spiritual understanding of the saints. 
Um, so we're number 12, the, the, the chalice has been uncovered. Now comes the offering of the bread and wine. Well, it's equivalent to the scourging of our Lord at the pillar. Yeah. And again, we read this in the, in the gospels. The scourging of the pillar is basically where our Lord's blood is shed again. Um, these are offered, so our Lord is offering himself entirely to his father, all that his father requires of him, that he lay down his life um, for our redemption. God so loved the world and, 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 and so on. The priest now covers the chalice with the pole. That's a white, a square white card, which is placed on top of the chalice. Um, in a certain sense, it's like a crown. It's a crown. It's the crown, crown of a lot of thorns. But the the purpose, the the um, physical purpose of the pole is essentially to stop insects or anything falling into the the chalice. But we can see that it does um, also represent the crown of thorns. And on some poles, there's actually a crown in the center of it. You know, I, you would not believe these dogs. We put them, we put one on the back and both of them gone to the back to bark. It's, uh, I should have to do an exorcism, I think next time. Okay, number 14. The priest now washes his hands at the epistle side of the altar. Of course, we all know immediately who washed their hands at, um, during the passion of our Lord, it is Pilate. Um, you know, he declared our Lord to be innocent. So our Lord Christ, Christ is declared innocent by Pilate. But the, the, um, the Jews would have none of it. They insist on, on um, um, our Lord being punished. You know, you are no friend of Caesar's and so on. So, the, the priest now goes back to the center and he turns to the people and says, Orate fratres, pray brethren, you know. Um, and this corresponds to Pilate, okay? Christ being shown to the people by Pilate, who says, behold the man, you know. It's, again, we, we read of this in St. John's Gospel. St. John is the only one of the evangelists to, to um, tell us that Pilate presented him to, to the people. So he says, behold the man, and our Lord appears now. He is crowned with thorns. He is tied. His hands are tied. He's bound. Um, he's scourged. He is dripping with blood, you know. Um, and Pilate says, no, whom... whom um, shall I release? And here the priest prays in a low, low voice. Grammar, he turns, he only says the first two words, orate fratres, continues the prayer as he completes the, the circle, turns full circle. And he continues the prayer in a low voice, and then the secret pr prayer, which corresponds to our Lord being mocked and spat upon, because um, the pilot has washed his hands of the whole affair, and as the priest recites the preface, the Sanctus, the bell is rung, Christ is condemned, Barabbas is freed. Again, all of which we read in, in the four gospels. So we have reached the part here where Barabbas is freed, our Lord is condemned to death, and um, his, he's taken now from the city of Jerusalem, and he's been led to Calvary. Calvary, was outside of the city. Okay, today of course is in the center of the of of Jerusalem, but you need to remember that when Jerusalem was destroyed, it was leveled to the ground. It's only afterwards, um, after the Christianization of the Roman Empire, we find that the the, the monks and, and Christians went to Jerusalem, and they built the new city around the hill of Calvary. This is why Calvary is now in the center of the New Jerusalem. So number 18, 
we we have the the priest is now be, has begun the the, the canon um, and he makes first of all the commemoration of the living so he begins to you most holy father we offer Torah, and he offers it for the living we'll go into this in detail next week but he offers first and foremost for the, the, the pope and the bishop and then for those who are present and so on so this represents symbolizes christ carrying the the his cross to calvary and he was praying as, as we read in the letter to hebrews praying all the time for sinners we know that he met the women on on the on the road and um he says weep not for me but for yourselves your children we know also that he had assistance with um um simon of cyrene you know about veronica and so on so all along the road our lord is praying for for us for calories <clears throat> so having made the commemoration of the living he then blesses the bread and the wine with the sign of the cross and this is done five times um again next week we'll go we'll go into it in in some detail um so the the five the five um cross signs of the cross that the priest makes corresponds of course to him being nailed to the cross um and again we read of this in the in the um four gospels Okay. So we, we've come now to the consecration, which is the central part of the mass. So the priest consecrates the hose. He adores it, genuflex, elevates it. And this corresponds to our Lord being raised on the cross. So having been nailed to the cross, the cross is now raised up so that they will look on the one whom they have pierced. And in a similar way, he consecrates the wine okay, and elevates the chalice. Of course, when our Lord is raised up, then the gravity takes over and the blood begins to drain from his wounds. So we, we see the, the flow of blood. And again, the, the four gospels give us um, an account of this. In the, in, once the canon begins, the priest prays in a low voice and our Lord uttered nothing. He, um, he said nothing um, once he had been condemned. Um, he, he speaks to Pilate. The last person he speaks to is Pilate. Um, and when um, our Lord speaks about truth, Pilate said truth, what is that? Pilate doesn't wait for an answer. Our Lord doesn't speak to any of the authorities again. He is concerned now is for the, the little ones, the poor sinners, those who believe in him. So he will speak to the women. Um, he will speak the, the words, the, the, the seven words on the cross and so on. So the priest therefore prays in a low voice um, to, to remind us that he was a lamb. He, he was as silent as a lamb going to the slaughter. The priest does, however, raise his voice at the nobis quoque for us sinners also, and he strikes his breast. And this is a prayer for all mankind, since we're all sinners. And this is recorded in the Gospels, of all four of them, in, in several places. Um, the Lord, the priest then, after the the um, commemoration of the dead, and he, he concludes, he recites aloud, his voice is raised once more, and he, he recites the Our Father. And the Our Father contains seven petitions, you know, three in regard to God and his glory, and um, four in regard to our needs. And this corresponds to our Lord who spoke seven times from the cross. Um, and the, the three times he spoke were in regard 
to us and to our salvation. Um, the the other four would be for his his um, work, the work that he had been given to do. Then number twenty five, him, the our father having been said, the the priest now breaks the sacred horse. And this corresponds again to our Lord dying on the cross. Um, in the new mass, um, the, um, the priests, of course, who don't know the, the, the power or the significance of, of the rights of the church, they will break the horse at the wrong time. And in fact, they, at the moment of consecration, they say he took the bread, broke it, and they'll break it obviously not understanding what they're doing. No, but here is where the sacred horse is broken, when our Lord dies. Okay. Um, and a particle is dropped into the chalice, okay, which is symbolic of our Lord's soul, which descends into limbo, to the to the um, place where the fathers were detained. Because of Adam's sin, no human um, could enter into heaven. Um, and those, the just who died before the coming of Christ were detained in limbo. Um, the good thief, of course, who died, um, uh, were, was also, had also gone down into, into limbo. So, this particle of the hose has dropped is symbolic of that. <clears throat> this, the, the particle having been dropped, the, the priest goes on to recite the Agnus Day. And here we have Christ is acknowledged to be the son of God by those standing beneath the cross. Um, and there were, there were three who did so. Um, first of all, the, we know the centurion, surely this, truly this man was the son of God. The, the, um, the crowd, they, they went home beating their breasts, um, we're told. And of course, our, our Lady and St. John, they knew him to be the Son of God. So we have the, the triple recitation of the Agnus Dei. Um, and again, you, you notice that it's the two of them, um, Lamb of God, we ask, have mercy on us. So that would be basically for the the um, centurion who was a Gentile and the Jews who realized what they had done and, and beat their breasts. And the last one, Grantus Peace, of course, would refer to those who already believed in him, namely Our Lady and the apostles and the, and the holy women who gathered there because at this point it was peace that they, 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 they required. You know, um, so then, this having been done, we come to the communion. So the priest receives the body and the blood of Christ. And this corresponds to Christ's body, which is laid in the sepulchre. Okay. Um, for, uh, again, the, in, in the prophet um, Ezekiel, um, I remember what this, oh, what chapter this. The prophet, prophet Ezekiel, it's, it's the middle of the prophet. There's a text that says, um, I mean to raise you from your graves, my people. And when I've opened your tombs, you will know that I am the Lord. Um, actually, in, in the Latin, there are two words. One is tumulus and the other one is sepulchre. Tumulus represents the spirit, the underworld, where the spirit is, where the sepulchre is, where the body is. And so when in, in that prophet, we, we, in that prophecy, we, we have essentially God promising to raise not only our souls from limbo, purgatory, uh, but also to, to raise our bodies from the tomb so that they be um, reunited. So the sepulchre then is at, at this stage, represents we who have received our Lord in the, in the, um, uh, in the sacrament. So <clears throat> communion having been completed, the priest now cleanses 
the chalice, purifies the chalice, would be a better way of saying it. He purifies the chalice. Um, and and by, by purification, we don't mean, of course, that the chalice is um, unworthy. It's simply that it has completed the sacred work, namely the, the consecration of the body of the Lord and the blood of the Lord. And so it needs to be purified from that. So it might be re um, returned to its ordinary tasks. And this uh, corresponds. <coughs> Pardon me. And this corresponds to Christ's body being anointed in the sepulchre. Um, you remember that Joseph of Arimathea and uh, Nicodemus they came with a um, hundred pounds weight of spices to anoint the body. And so the priest, having purified the chalice, he prepares the chalice on the altar again. So the chalice is once more covered. And here we have Christ rising from the dead. Um, so this is now the third day. So we, having done this, the, the priest, he's at the center of the altar. He turns now to the people and with the Dominus Hobiscum. And this represents his appearing on the third day to his mother and the disciples. Um, scripture doesn't tell us that he appeared to Our Lady, but common sense alone tells us that. I mean, you know, who in their right mind, which, which son in his right mind, having put his mother through such um, uh, trauma, would not be the first to, to reassure her and to comfort her, console her, and fill her with joy. He appeared to Simon. We know that because... In St. Luke's Gospel, when the two disciples um, on, on the road to Emmaus returned to Jerusalem, they, they greeted, yes, the Lord has risen, he has appeared to Simon. Yet there's nowhere that we are told of that, uh, that encounter except there. And St. Paul also mentions it in uh, 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, where he does say that our Lord appeared to Simon Cephas that he did appear to James. There's no account of that anywhere except, except in that letter to Corinthians. Um, and so we, we can, with all certainty, um, be certain, with all certainty, we're certain that he appeared to his mother and the, of course the other disciples, which, which is something recorded. Oh, actually it's there one Corinthians, um, the, which is recorded in all the, all the um, gospels. So our Lord now would spend the next 40 days with his disciples. And what would he be doing? Well, what he be, did when he first began his missionary work, he was teaching. He went into the synagogues in various places and he, he, he taught and he taught and he taught. And this is what he now does in the, um, Post in the communion antiphon and the post communion prayers. Okay, he teaches for 40 days. You know. um, and we, we know that he certainly did that with the two disciples on the way to Emmaus. He, beginning with Moses, he went on to explain to them all the things that in the scriptures that applied to him, in the prophets and in the law and, and so on how they applied to him. So he now would confirm the disciples in this teaching. And so we come to, um, the, having read the post-communion prayer, he turns to the people and says the last Dominus Fabisco. Okay, and in this, we see Christ bidding farewell to his disciples. You know, this is the end, his work is done. Uh, it is now, their work, or rather the work of the Holy Spirit in them to, to bring the gospel of salvation to the whole world. So having said the, the um, last Dominus for Piscum, the priest then ends the Mass, Ite, Misa, Es. And with this, he commissions, Christ is commissioning the apostles to preach the gospel to all nations as he ascends into heaven, go out into the whole world, teach all nations. And, and so on. And having ended the mass again, the priest 
turns, faces the altar, recites the, um, the, the, the plachet, and turns and gives the blessing to the people, which corresponds to our Lord sending down the Holy Ghost at Pentecost, um, which of course you understand makes perfect sense. The Mass, what the Mass is, the meaning of Mass, again, we'll deal with it in, in, in detail on, a, on another, another day. But um, essentially, it's the, the sacrifice is complete. The Lord has returned. He has finished his work. Um, the blessing now is given, which comes from heaven, which is the, the Holy Ghost himself. And then finally, the last gospel is read. Well, the gospel is the good news about Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And this is what is to be preached and worshipped throughout the world. And it's to be done so as the Son of God made man. So this is why we use um, St. John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And from him, we receive grace and truth. And essentially this, again, we, we read all of this in the gospel of according to Mark and in the letters of St. Paul. So it's essentially from the scripture point of view, from the gospels, we can see that the, the actions in the mass, they, they're not, it's not theater, it is something that's rooted in and full of meaning from the gospels, from the scriptures themselves. And it's up to us to grasp this mystery to, and to enter into the, into the mystery. And I hope that this will certainly enhance your attendance at mass. As, as I said, now next week, what I, um, what I want to do is to have an overview of the mass um, from a theological um, perspective. What, what we've done today is to go through it scripturally. So um, I, I, hope, I hope I succeeded. I, I've tried to show that our Lord's passion is, is death and resurrection, which, which began in the garden and which was completed by his resurrection is all contained in the, in the traditional Latin mass, the Tridentine mass, the mass of ages the apostolic mass, the, um, this is the mass that was the St. Gregory the Great, who, 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 who died in 604. This is the mass that he would have known, and before him, Pope Leo, and before him, um, Galatius, and, and, um, and so on. This is the mass that formed the saints who we venerate today. You know, this is the mass that has um, that that the, 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 that um, most of the cardinals would have been baptized in. You know, um, so it, it's the, the attack on it is about five hundred years old. It, the attack on it began with Luther, who rejected all of these symbols um, because essentially he could not accept that. Um, that the the mass was a sacrifice. He couldn't accept that. He couldn't accept the efficacy of the sacraments because the sacraments themselves flow from the mass. And what has happened to us as Catholics is that we have lost the sense of the sacrifice. We have lost the sense that our Lord is in the center of the mass and that we have been privileged to join him on Calvary whenever we go to Mass and to stand at the side of his Blessed Mother and Saint John the Evangelist and the Holy Women. So let us, next time we go to Mass, try to keep these thoughts in mind and so enrich our, our um, devotion and obtain grace from Christ who died for our salvation. Thank you. Okay, um, I've, we've got 10 minutes, so um, I'm willing to take questions if there are any. Of line, line it. 
Yes. Could you uncover the prayer to the Blessed Virgin Mary before Mass for us? Sure. It's on it's on the notes that I... Um, okay, Father, yeah, Father, does it want... come at those notes? So in the next week, it will come at those. It didn't come at the notes that you sent. Oh, okay. So All it right. will come next week, so I will send okay. it out. Right. Okay. Right. Um, there's Thank several you. prayers in the Missal for, um, to be said before Mass. And, and indeed after mass. Um, I, I, this one is, is uh, um, particularly uh, to the, to the point, on point, but there's also one to, to St. Joseph and also to the, um, uh, the, the saints and the angels um, and so on. Father, oh, is this the missile that you, the priests, use? Or is this, like I have the 1962 missile. So um, I can't remember seeing if you, I, I, I can't, if you look in the index, there may be a section with prayers before mass and after mass. Um, some of the missiles have, have those prayers. I can, I can send you, I'll, I, I want to, to um, have a, a source source material. So I'll send you the links to, to various um, sites, internet sites with, with prayers. Mm -hmm. I better make a note of that. Um, I think Adsumus is one. I think. Okay, what it has in this, sorry, Father, what it has in, in the 1962 missile is Psalms in preparation for Holy Mass. Psalms yes. 84, 85. Yeah, there, there are Psalms as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have the prayers. It doesn't have the prayers. Okay. I can, I'll send you the link with, with them um, in, in, my, in my next meeting. Okay, thanks, Father. Good afternoon, Father. Um, good, afternoon. good afternoon. Um, question for you. Um, so you would have mentioned that uh, many, many yeah. of these saints would have written uh, commentaries about the mass, um, um, similar to the uh, symbolism that you would have just described there, right? Yes. yes. Um, is it um is it is it possible that you could um send us just a few uh, references in terms of some of the works that uh, yes. somebody seen um, would have Saint, written. St. Thomas, St. Thomas Aquinas, okay. for sure. Um, St. Alphonsus um, Ligori, for another. St. Lawrence of Brindisi um, is another. There, um, St. August, Augustine has some references, but they, they're very early um, to them. But I think St. Bernard as well. They, they usually come under commentaries on the mass. Um, with, um, with, with those, the, the only, the, the, the difficulty is, that the language sometimes is a bit heavy to, you know, especially St. Thomas, everything is so tight and compact, you know. But um, it, as I said, it, it, once, is there something you read and then you, you need to, to discuss it in order to, to um, grasp it better? And I'm quite happy, happy to do that. Okay. And thank you, Father. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions, observations? Father, I wonder if um, you might consider contrasting your analysis on the traditional mass with the Novus Ordo in this series, or is it is it strictly a focus on the traditional Latin mass? Um, the Father Thwaites, who is my spiritual director, um, 
from Tamimati University, um, 1970. No, um, and, and 1970, this is when, you know, this is when the new mass was launched and uh, there was a lot of uncertainty. We were very unsettled. And father said to me, he said, um, Mother Church cannot poison her children. She may not give us the best food sometimes, but she cannot poison us. Um, in other words, that the, the new mass may not be as um, beautiful or nourishing or, or spiritually uplifting as the, as the old mass, but in itself, it, it's not heretical. Um, and uh, for me, that's been a, a mainstay. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, and, but when, when you've seen what's happened in the new mass, the, the sacrileges and the blasphemies that occur, um, you, could, you have to wonder, but realize it's not the church that has given this, given us this right, but rather um, it, it's priests who, bishops who have not understood and have tried to put their own personality into it. So I'd, I'd avoid, I'd like to avoid um, making this um, controversial or polemical, um, because I think it's better to light the candle than curse the darkness. Uh, I think it's better for us to know the treasure we have so that we value it more and protect it. And, and um, if, if we can um, enhance our own spiritual life by enjoying, whilst we can, the, this, um, the, this mass, I think we would have contributed a great deal to others. Um, in, in today's gospel, in the tradition mass, we had the, the um, centurion who interceded for his servant, you know, um, and we, we, we can do that as well. We can intercede with the Lord for our friends, those who do not understand. And, and it's not, it's really not their fault. The fact that we believe and we can see the value and see the beauty and see the truth in the mass, it's nothing we have done. It's a gift, it's a grace from God, a gift from God. And we have to be grateful for it and humble about it because as he's given it to us, you know, we could easily lose it as well because of our carelessness or mm -hmm. um, because of our pride, our sinfulness. And so we just have to be grateful. And I think it's better to, to um, understand this treasure. I, I will, that doesn't mean I won't make comparisons now and again, but it's not going to be my main focus. My, my question, Father, is in observing our um the uh, mass um obligation for mass yeah um we once the novus order is available we should go to that mass to observe our sunday and holy days we ought yes but i, I think we but if we have been fortified by this then we we, we should be fairly safe. We will recognize and see very clearly um, the errors. And also we can say why what is being done in Novus Ordo is wrong. For instance, as I pointed out, breaking the, the hose at the moment of consecration is wrong because it's break, it has broken the symbolism. It's, it's not that our Lord broke it then, but rather it's, it's because the the... the, the we are at mass, we are looking at Calvary. What's happened in Calvary? And not on what happened at the Last Supper, if you're with me. Mm -hmm. What our Lord did at the Last Supper was in preparation for Calvary. It was, you know, anticipating Calvary. Now we are looking back, we are remembering Calvary. So you know when we um, when we see the dancing, for instance, in Novus Ordo, you can ask the legitimate question: What's the purpose? What does that mean? When priests or or bishops refer to it as a celebration, we say no. It's first and foremost a sacrifice, because even the missal, the beginning of the missal, it says it's a sacrifice. It's not a celebration. And even if we talk about the celebration, what do we mean? When, when we, on, in, on November, November 11th, Armistice Day, we celebrate 
don't we? But the law people died. So are we celebrating their death? No, we're celebrating what they did for us. Okay, so we don't have dancing on Amos' Sunday. Can you, can you see what I'm driving at? Sure. You know, there, there is a, we have to be, the, the, the problem is one of words because um, words are living, they're flexible. And so they do not convey the, um, the, the same meaning to everyone simultaneously. Well, so Father, what do you how do you feel about us the late if you see something wrong approaching the priest to point it out to him? Um, I know that there's a. I remember Father Defu used to say, um, used to tell us, um, if you see me doing something wrong, don't criticize me, um, pray for me. You know, he used to emphasize praying for him for whatever we saw instead of approaching him on it. Um, yes, sorry, um, I should have, sorry, I should have, um, um, uh, stopped sharing my screen. I'm having trouble doing that now. How do, how do I do that? Oh, okay, I see it. Okay, sorry about that. I'll, I'll get, I'll get this, um, going yes, soon. Yes, but by, by the end of sorry this session, that. by the end of this course, yeah. you would be perfect. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yes. Yes. Um, yes. If if you see a priest, um, certainly if I'm doing something wrong, I appreciate um, uh, being told about it. Um, so we, I mean, being human, we do things inadvertently without thinking, um, and certainly um, I have no problem with if I'm doing something wrong. I have no problem people asking me, telling me, correcting me. I have no problem with that at all. I appreciate it. Um, again, if if it's if a priest is doing it and you're a lay person, you have to be very careful because some priests uh, don't appreciate being corrected. But and so you should make sure you know um, why you know why the thing is wrong or why there is a possible error. And so I'd suggest asking the question, Father, um, why did you do this? Or do you think this is the right thing to do? Rather than be confrontational, um, uh, simply because um, human respect, you know, a priest will feel affronted, you know? Um, and you can always tell when they, are, when they know they're doing wrong, when, you, when they appeal to authority, I'm the priest. I mean, that, that, that doesn't wash with, with, with me. Um, we, we are servants of the church, priests, bishops, even the Pope, we are servants of the church. We are to do what the Holy Church requires of us, um, especially when it comes to the sacraments, because the sacraments are the means by which Christ touches us, just as his clothes were a source of healing to, um, to those who touched it, the woman who came up behind him, or the crowds that gathered around him, they tried to touch him when he came down from the mountain. You know, and so we should be very careful not to to hinder Christ meeting his people and his people meeting him. So of course that brings up the whole talk about communion on the tongue, Father, because we've been denied communion on the tongue in Trinidad. Yeah. By, by the bishop, he is he, he has stated that very clearly. And you know. You know, I go for communion and, and, and I'm denied it. You know. Yeah. The um, in canon law, the bishop doesn't have the right to do that to do this huh? because the the communion on the tongue is the norm, and you cannot. The, no bishop has the authority to restrict what the church has generously. Um, given, you know, so in in, in canon law, he, he is in, he is wrong, um, but um, he's he's the bishop, so it does put the laity in a difficult position. Um, pray for him is the, the best advice I can give. Um, 
as well. So we're doing that every day. Okay. Um, well, it's just gone six. So th thank you for your um, attention. I hope I succeeded in, in um, raising your um, interest in the mass um, to a higher level. Um, as I said, next week, I hope to go, I, I, I hope to go on to reviewing the mass from a theological perspective using St. Thomas's commentary on it. Um, and then after that, we'll focus just on the canon um, because, and see how the canon um, fits in with the actual sufferings of our Lord. Um, and in fact, what we pray for in the canon. So thank you very much. And um, we'll see you next Sunday for the Mass, Thursday for Latin, please God. And yes, we can, can end we do the Angelus. Can we do, can yes, we do the Angelus? We end with the Angelus, yes. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord to thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, bring for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be thou unto me. Be thou unto me. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord to thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Holy Mary, Mother. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And dwelt in me. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord to thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mother of God, Mary, Mother of God pray for us now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. That, that, that we that may be made worthy, worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth and beseech you, O Lord, with thy grace into our hearts, that we hold the incarnation of Christ, thy Son, was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection in the same Christ our Lord. Amen. May the divine sister should be in all of us. And may the souls of the faithful departed to the mercy of God. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you, remain with you now and always. Amen. Thank, thank you, Father. Thank you very thank much. You, we appreciate thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank okay. you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, 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 Thank you,